Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of what is modern-day Turkey. <laughs> Thanks to our Sunday school class, we learned that this morning. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, when they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to once at leave, to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. This is the word of God for the people of God. I still think you should pronounce those last ones, or those first ones. Man. In modern day dirt. So we continue our series entitled uh, Fact or Fiction, where we look at some of those phrases that we, we use in church a lot, and they sound churchy, but they really, really aren't. So many times we have a lot of difficulties in determining whether a door is open or closed, especially when it comes to God. It, it can be confusing. It can be difficult. We often hear it said, when God shuts one door, he opens another. Right? Or, or if you happen to like the sound of music, do you remember what Maria said? When God shuts one door, he opens a window. Same idea, same mentality, uh, and if you have not seen The Sound of Music, you should. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, as different than all the other ones we've talked about, this one, although not in Scripture, is actually pretty accurate. This one is really not wrong. Now, we don't know for sure where the phrase came from, but they think it might have come from Alexander Graham Bell. He's quoted as saying, when one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which is opened for us. Again, not scripture, but actually it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And we see all sorts of examples in scripture of doors opening and closing. And we definitely see it in the book of Acts, this reading that Andy read. You see, Paul had decided to take the gospel into Asia Minor. That's an even fancier way of saying it. But God had other plans, and so a door was shut. Then he tried to go into modern-day Russia, but a door was shut. So he kept moving west. And then God opened the door for him to go into modern-day Greece. Now, this is significant. I don't know how many of you actually realize how significant this particular event was. Because this was the first time the gospel had been brought into modern day Europe. This was significant. This was important. All of a sudden, there was a whole new region that had been opened up with the gospel. So we're going to go through and see what we can experience with Paul. First of all, God wants to guide us if we'll let him. You see, God is personally involved in all of our lives. If you don't believe that, see me after church because I will prove it to you. I, and I'm not going to do it in a mean way, but I think we, we really need to understand that God is involved in every one of our lives significantly and in very important ways. The God of the universe, the one who created everything, is interested in us. And so we need to understand that. If we look at the reading in Proverbs, we see it there as well. From the beginning, God was interested in us, watching out for us, looking at our lives and seeing the significance of it. The problem being is there's a lot of confusion, isn't there? Sometimes there's a lot of confusion in knowing what God has planned for us. What, what is our direction in life? What we should look for? What are we supposed to do? Many people like to, to hurry God along. 
They, they, they do things like um, looking at their astrology signs and looking it up in the newspaper or, or tarot cards or uh, mediums or psychics or if they're really desperate, pulling out the fortune cookie and you know how accurate those are, right? But the thing is, there's also some people that get so, so paralyzed by indecision that they do absolutely nothing. And honestly, their lives can be a waste if they do that. The important thing is recognizing and being conscious of the decisions that God wants to make for us. Being clear about what God wants. Being clear about what he is telling us. There was this man who his wife was going to be having her, her birthday. And he was never real good about giving birthday presents for her. So he said, honey... I want to make sure I get you exactly what you want for your birthday. So, if there were no limits, if you could have anything you wanted, what would you want for your birthday? She thought about it a second and she said, I'd love to be six again. He said, all right, and he thought about it. So the next morning... He got her up and made her waffles, put plenty of whipped cream on top, sprinkled, even sprinkled some chocolate chips. On. I mean, he, he did good. Then when they got done, he took her to the amusement park and rode every ride. Made sure she had cotton candy and corn dogs and all that good stuff. You know, stuff we're not supposed to eat. Then when they got done with that, he took her to McDonald's. Made sure she had a milkshake and a Big Mac. I mean... All those salty fries that you know are really not good for you, but taste so good. Then he took her to the movies. Disney had a brand new animated film out. So he took her to that. And of course, you got to have popcorn and the snacks there at the movie. So he had her, I mean, she had the milk duds and everything. She was set. So finally, they get home and she just like collapses on the bed. And he said, honey... How'd I do? How was your birthday? What was it like to be six again? And she barely opened one eye, looked at him and said, I was talking about my dress size. <laughs> and you know, if she was eating all that stuff, she was not going to get back to the six anytime soon. <laughs> you see, there was a misunderstanding. There was confusion. He had a basic idea, but he didn't clarify and that's part of the problem that we have sometimes. We have a basic idea of what God wants us to do. But sometimes, well, we kind of take it in the wrong direction. We have to find the best that God has for us. And we need to remember even more a couple of things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to all listen to this very, very carefully. One of the things... Okay, that could not have been timed any better. <laughs> we'll have mom explain it to you later. <laughs> but I want you to make sure to ask yourself this question, or, or to think about this question. Don't ask God, don't ask, what is God's will for my life? Don't ask, what is God's will for my life? How many of you, let's be honest, how many of you have said that? What is God's will for my life? Come on, I know I'm not the only one. Do you know we're not supposed to ask that question? We shouldn't. We should not ask that question. We should instead ask, what is God's will? Now, there's a, a, a slight difference there, but there is a significance. You see, the first question, the focus, is what? Me. Me. The second question, what's the focus? God. And that's the difference. That's the significant difference. You see, God is already at work around us. We need to, to find where he is and jump on board. We need to be able to, to continue with him. Not waiting, not having him wait on us. He's already moving. As much as we may think differently, God doesn't need us to get anything done. He lets us take part in it. But he's already got everything in motion. How, how many of you remember getting on a merry-go-round? It was always much more fun getting on it when it was already 
spinning around. Wasn't that always so much more fun? Your arms get jerked out of your sockets a little bit and you just, but you jump on. It was so much more fun. Well, that's what's going on. God's already got the merry-go-round spinning. We need to jump on. And when we jump on, we can help others get on. We can help get that merry-go-round going even faster. We can hang on to others so they don't fly off. You see, we need to recognize that God is already in motion. In Acts 16, God was at work saving the Gentiles, us. God was in the process of taking the gospel to the Roman Empire, and Paul found closed doors until he got involved with God's plan. So we need to start looking around at where God is working and get involved. We need to throw ourselves into whatever work it, that may exist. Very often we, we talk about when we're doing ministries, what new ministry can we start? We, we've all said that. I've said that. What new ministry can we start? I don't think we ask, again, the right question. Maybe we need to ask, what ministry do we need to help with? What ministry do we need to get involved with? Because there's other churches in our area that are doing ministries. Or there's other ministries happening all around us. Why can't we just say, let's get on board with them? Rather than reinvent the wheel. We need to think about what is God revealing to us through his will. And of course, God doesn't reveal everything all at once either, does he? Because Paul didn't get all the details of what was going to go on, did he? He, he? he didn't get told, well, go to, to Philippi, then to Athens, then to Corinth. Instead, God just said to Paul, go, and Paul went. And that happens a lot in Scripture. We see that a lot in Scripture, where God tells his people to go, and they have to go without any idea of what the journey is going to look like. And granted, it would be nice if God gave us, sometimes it would be nice if God gave us all of this, right? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to high school. I want you to graduate. I want you to go to college. I want you to get this degree, and then I want you to get this job, and then marry this person, and this is the number of kids you should have, and this is what you should do in your retirement. It'd be kind of nice sometimes, but then again, wouldn't life be kind of boring if it all been planned out for us? If we didn't have the experience of learning and growing? But understand that following God isn't about the destination. It's more about the journey. The second thing we need to consider is don't, be, don't get crushed by closed doors. You see, as Paul began to head north, he encountered a closed door in Asia Minor. Then he tried to go north uh, towards the Black Sea and then another closed door. And then, well, we've all been there, haven't we? We keep bumping our noses against those closed doors. And we get frustrated. We get, we get annoyed. So God does shut doors, yes, but he isn't the only one, though, is he? Sometimes, sometimes we have to ask the question, did God close this door or did something else? Sometimes there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be barriers. There's going to be things that make our lives difficult. Things that will discourage us and run us down. But that doesn't mean that God isn't leading us through that closed door. There was a, a pastor who was on vacation. He was driving through this kind of backwoods area. And it was Sunday, so he decided to stop at a church. So he stopped at this church, and he walked in and met the pastor and explained who he was. And the, the home church pastor said, I would love for you to come up and, and give us a prayer. I, I would love for you to be a part of it. I don't expect you to preach, but I want you to be a part of it. And, you know, anytime you give a pastor a chance to speak, we're going to do it. So the visiting pastor comes up on stage, and they're about ready. And all of a sudden, he realized it was one of those churches. He saw people walking around with snakes. So the visiting pastor calmly walked over to the hometown pastor and said, excuse me, where's your back door? And that, that home church pastor says, well, I'm sorry, we don't have one. 
And the visiting pastor says, I don't do snakes. You better decide where you want the back door because I'm making one. <laughs> you see, we sometimes have to break down a wall. Sometimes we have to break down a door. If that's where God is leading you, then that's what you do. There will be obstacles. There will be issues. There will be problems that come before you. Especially, it seems like, when you are following God's will. Just make sure that the door is being shut against God and not by God. In experiencing God, Henry Blackby said, When you began to follow God and circumstances seemed to close doors of opportunity, go back to the Lord and clarify what God has said. He most often is not calling you to a task, but to a relationship. Through that relationship, he's going to do something with your life. You see, when Paul was told no by God, it was because God wanted to say yes to something better. Lots of times the things that we think are failures turn out to be blessings in disguise. In the late 1800s, cotton was, well, almost a god, right? I mean, it was in the South, you grew cotton. And that was the crop to have. And so everybody was growing it and everybody was getting wealthy. Well, in the, the early 1900s, somebody else showed up. The Mexican ball weevil. Turns out the Mexican ball weevil really likes cotton too. It crossed the border into Texas and began to move east and wiped out fields and fields of cotton. Everybody was losing everything that they had because of these annoying little critters. Well, one farmer decided, I'm gonna grow peanuts. And it may seem odd, but the first year he produced over 6,000 bushels. And soon other farmers jumped on board. And then in 1919, the city of Enterprise, Alabama, erected a monument to the Weevil because it had made a difference. It had actually, they, they thought they were doing good until that annoying little bug showed up and then they really did well. Now, many would have thought, oh, this is a failure. This is horrible. Nothing good can come from this little weevil. And I'm sure they had a lot of other names for it at that point, too. But because of that, they went in a different direction that they never would have done unless they'd been forced to. And very often, we're the same way. Until we're forced to make a change, we really won't. Lastly, I want us to look at making sure that we're moving. Keeping moving while we're looking for God's open door. You see, when Paul encountered those closed doors, he didn't sulk about it. He didn't complain. He didn't say that he was going to stop. He didn't say, all right, God, I'm done. No, he kept on moving. He went west and eventually took the gospel into Europe. And so when we encounter a closed door, we shouldn't stop moving. We need to keep moving and God will direct our path. Now, we need to be careful in how we look at this because there's also waiting upon the Lord, right? We've used that, we need to wait upon the Lord. And that's right, we should. We should wait upon the Lord, but that doesn't mean we stop. That doesn't mean we should be passive. It's more like a waiter at a restaurant, a good one, who takes your order and serves you, and then keeps coming back and making sure that you don't need anything else. That's what we should be to God. Once we're stopped someplace, we're still serving God and say to God, is there anything I can do while I'm here? Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for the people around me? You've stopped me for a purpose. Maybe that's pr that purpose is doing something for others. Let me know what I'm supposed to do. I found this phrase in a book I read this week. It, it's... Spiritual momentum. We can't lose our spiritual momentum. It's like a boat. A boat sitting dead in the water. How, how effective is that rudder if a boat is dead in the water? 
It doesn't do any good, does it? A boat has to be in motion before the rudder can be put into use. Has to be. It's literally dead in the water. And that's the way it is with God's will. When we just stop altogether, we're dead in the water. But if we're active, then we have forward momentum and we're, not, we're, a, we're a lot easier to steer into a different type of service. So we need to be constantly in motion, seeking out these, these open doors that God has placed before us. Because he has a plan. He has a, a, an idea for us to, to do. We need to jump on board. I'm going to leave you with this final quote by Elizabeth Elliot. It says, the will of God is not something you add to your life. It's a course you choose. You either line yourself up with the Son of God, or you instead turn to the principle which governs the rest of the world. So, what are you doing? Let's bow our heads.